it is a great pleasure to be chairman uh, to this session that uh, is on um, modeling and simulation in different domains. I am uh, Antonella Petrillo from University of Naples, Parthenope, and um, I hope you are enjoying the conference if it is virtual. However, with uh, due to the pandemic situation, we have understood that the future will be characterized by digitalization. So things that were previously not uh, uh, unthinkable now are possible thanks to the digitalization and distance are shorted. But of course, in my personal opinion, it is a very good this kind of organization. It is a great opportunity. Uh, but I hope to be in person for the next edition because uh, to be in person it means to have the opportunity to share ideas, mix new friends and have a real coffee together. So uh, I hope that we will see next year uh, uh, in person. But now we can start our session and uh, if we are ready we can start uh, with the first paper uh, the title of our paper is a credit model for an effective maintenance of hospital critical systems. Uh, authors are Ora Haital, Raid Hayamore, and Jochen Hambel. Excuse me for my pronunciation. I am not very good with your uh, names, uh, but I understand that uh, the presenter is um, Ma. Marah, really. Marah. And yeah. So please uh, share your video or your presentation as you, as you prefer and pay attention to the time. Okay, thank you so much. Hello everyone, I hope you are having a nice day. I am Marah Hittal and today I'm going to present uh, a research that uh, was submitted to the 18th International Multidisciplinary Modeling and Simulation Multi-Conference and it focuses on the application of data-driven predictive maintenance for a hospital HVAC systems using machine learning algorithms. And the authors of this conference paper are Professor uh, Raed Al Amar, Professor Jochen Abel, and me, Marahitel. In this presentation, I will begin by giving a brief introduction to the topic. Then I'm going to, the, to define the purpose of the research. After, after that, I'm going uh, through the methodology and how the model was illustrated through a real world case study. Then I'm going to show and discuss the results. And at the end, I will conclude the output and the outcomes of this paper. The introduction will focus on building maintenance and facility management. Facility management in buildings usually conduct reactive or preventive maintenance strategies in building maintenance management. However, corrective maintenance cannot prevent failure while uh, preventive ma maintenance, even if it is effective, but unnecessary inspections increase the facility management cost. And as conducted by the literature, one third of the maintenance expenses are carried out unnecessarily, while 65% of the annual facility management costs account for maintenance costs, which is considered considered to be a very big ratio. In this figure, we can show uh, the relationship between the number of failures and costs for different maintenance practices. In corrective maintenance, the number of failures uh, is high and the cost is high and in preventive maintenance the number of failures is very low and the cost is very high so uh, there was a need to adopt effective maintenance strategies that tackles the issue of balancing operational effectiveness and maintenance cost and this by and this will be achieved by applying predictive maintenance practices that analyze data generated from building systems to detect uncontrolled failures and analyze performance degradation, and by which it will avoid unnecessarily costly inspections associated by time-based maintenance and convert it into condition-based maintenance. One of the most critical building types is hospitals because hospital systems efficiency is vital since failures may lead to multiple health complications. And the heating, ventilation and air conditioning system that provides adequate air conditioning and good 
endure can uh, could endure air quality is considered to be one of the most essential systems in hospitals. Uh, and the AR air handling units are one of, uh, of the critical HVAC systems in the hospitals as it is responsible for controlling the indoor air quality of the building. Therefore, facility managers are recommended to adopt predictive maintenance to optimize the performance of the HVAC system and minimize the maintenance costs associated with those systems. After reviewing the latest research that have conducted studies on predictive maintenance for heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, we came up with these research graphs which indicate that there is a lack of studies on data-driven data -driven predictive maintenance for HVAC system and studies that focuses on the utilization of building management system and computerized maintenance management system for predictive maintenance of HVAC system and lack of studies that apply machine learning algorithms to predict the future condition of the HVAC system. And based on these research gaps, the research question was how to apply data-driven predictive maintenance model using building management system, computerized maintenance management system, and machine learning technologies to improve, to improve HVAC system maintenance efficiency in hospitals. Moving to the methodology, the, the development of the predictive maintenance model was stimulated by previously identified by the previously identified research gaps and the work done by Cheng and his colleagues. The developed model is structured based on three main technologies. The first one is the building management system that helps facility management staff to monitor and control building systems by collecting sensor data. And the second one is computerized maintenance management system that also used as a decision tool to improve the efficiency of facility management. And the third one is the machine learning algorithms that are used to predict the condition of the HVAC systems. The sensor data of the air handling unit were collected from the building management system uh, installed in a hospital in Jordan and were used as a case study to train the, uh, the algorithms used to predict the condition of the air handling unit. The air handling unit in, it, in, in the hospital regulates the indoor air quality in different hospital zones by controlling the following parameters, temperature, humidity, airflow, and air quality. And this is a screenshot from the graphical user interface of the building management system installed in the hospital. And it shows how the, sen the sensor readings for uh, different sensors are displayed on the screen. For current condition prediction, we use the support vector um, uh, machine algorithm as a classification model to uh, predict, uh, to classify the condition of the machine based on a scale from zero to 10. So the uh, support vector machine uh, will uh, model will take uh, the inputs uh, of the uh, temperature, pressure, airflow, CO2 sensors and the unit name and location in order to predict the condition of the machine. In order to train the model, uh, we use those variables and we split the, the data. 70% were used for model training and 30% were used for model testing. While we use the same data to predict uh, the future condition of the uh, of the air handling unit using profit forecasting algorithm, and the difference between uh, the support vector machine and the profit forecasting algorithm is the profit forecasting output will be uh, a predicted a future condition on different time phases in the future. The accuracies achieved by both models and the output will be discussed in the following sections. The performance of the support vector machine algorithm, algorithm achieved uh, an accuracy of 49.06%, while the profit forecasting algorithm achieved an accuracy of 95.43%. Both accuracies indicate that the effectiveness of the developed model has proved to be good to predict the condition of the AHU. In addition to the accuracies achieved, we used uh, the profit forecasting to, pre uh, to predict uh, the condition of the air handling unit for the uh, following uh, year. And uh, in this graph, the black dots re uh, represents the condition of the machine during the last year, and the uh, blue line represents the, uh, the predicted condition. And uh, due to the fluctuations in the condition of the machine, the model predicts uh, a degradation in the condition of the machine. And the, the table sh it shows that the machine will be uh, degraded from 
uh, 9 uh, to uh, 7.2 in scale from 1 to 10. Uh, unfortunately, since uh, this field is still in its early stages, there is no benchmark to verify the achieved accuracy. However, comparing the results obtained uh, to a similar work done by Cheng, uh, the obtained accuracy was found to be acceptable. But uh, there were some limitations that affect the achieved results. The first one is the limit limitation of data set size. The second one is the lack of faulty condition data. The third one is the selection of the machine learning algorithms. And the uh, last one is the um, uh, the is that the model did not uh, cover uh, all HVAC systems, but uh, only uh, air handling units. On the other hand, the operational implications uh, uh, um, um, that the model can achieve will be that the model uh, will allow FM staff to receive alerts as early as possible to avoid failures before they occur, and they will help them in preparing maintenance materials and tools ahead of time to minimize or avoid overtime costs. It will also increase the efficiency of air handling unit, unit which will increase the hospital indoor air quality and reduce energy consumption. Moving to the last section, which concludes a small summary of the study with identifying the research contributions and, other, and outcomes. So, in this study, a model for predictive maintenance was developed using machine learning algorithms to monitor and predict the condition of an air handling unit within the HVAC system of a hospital. And the research, uh, this research has contributed to the literature by uh, investigating the forecasting aspects of predictive maintenance by predicting the future condition of the air handling unit, utilizing building management system and computerized maintenance management system for continuous condition monitoring and prediction, and contributing to the literature by employing new machine learning algorithms for AHU condition prediction. Here we come to the end of this presentation. Thank you, and now I'm ready to hear your questions and comments. First of all, thank you to you for your nice, uh, interesting presentation. Um, I would like to ask uh, to the audience if uh, there are any questions, curiosity, any doubt, any question. Um, I have a, a curiosity. It is, it is not a real question. Mm -hmm. Since uh, you are an expert uh, in the maintenance field, in uh, your opinion, in uh, this area of uh, digitalization, what are the opportunity for productive maintenance? Uh, well, I think it will be a great opportunity since uh, we are now open more to the artificial intelligence and the application of artificial intelligence. But as I always say that the predictive maintenance will not neglect, neglect the, the human factor because we will always depend on the human decisions. So we will not like, we will not fully um, concentrate on the, the decisions by, by, uh, made by artificial intelligence and neglect uh, the human uh, opinion, but it will assist. So it will ease the process. It will like um, make it more easier. So maybe like, um, for example, if there is like a factory, and uh, like the manager, a senior manager in, in one line production was like off. OK, so maybe like those systems may like cover the absence of uh, like maybe urgent ab absence of uh, humans just to support the system. So I think it will be like it, it will has uh, it will like uh, have a room for uh, like for decisions, but it will not totally neglect uh, the human opinion, the human uh, factor in decisions. So yes, I, I see it like it will has like a, a room, but maybe um, like not fully, uh, we will not fully uh, depend on it. Clear, it is clear. Yeah. You stressed a good point that uh, in any case, uh, the decision are by humans. So maybe the future will be characterized by integration of uh, different technology in which the man is uh, uh, 
is the, the real uh, stretch of the process, but helped by the technology, so to reduce the human errors. Maybe yes. the integration of artificial intelligence or quantum computers and so on. Okay, nice uh, point of view. Um, if there are not any questions, but please uh, interrupt me if you have had any question. I think that we can um, go ahead with uh, the second presentation. So thanks again for your presentation and we will continue. Uh, the second presentation is uh, on educational case study. Evaluation of guarantee service on low earth orbit satellite, satellite type networks. The presenter, I mean, it is um, Andreas. Andreas, so please, you can share your presentation. Good morning. I proceed. Do you see the presentation now? Uh, really not yet. Okay, then let me see. Okay. Uh, Ah, okay, uh, yes. It's okay. El error. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. now yes. Let's, let's try the sound. Going to present our educational case study that we have implemented uh, this year in a subject dealing uh, with the application of queuing theory on communication networks. The idea behind is that uh, students deal with a classical problem. Sorry. Don't worry. It is to stop my microphone. So. but in a more modern setting. Krupp studied the impact of alternate routing on the performance of a switch circuit switching network in a symmetrical configuration. Uh, we have uh, several nodes, all fully interconnected. Uh, every pair of nodes serve uh, a set of users that offer the same amount of traffic between them and alternate routing consists of after the direct link between two nodes is found busy to explore all of the uh, two hops routes trying to carry uh, that uh, petition. What group found was that under uh, an overload situation, the system misbehaves. Uh, there is a point where, as uh, the offer traffic increases, the carry traffic decreases. This congestion situation is undesirable, and there is a classic uh, solution that we will also explore in our modern setting. We propose an hypothetical lower orbit satellite network to our students, where satellites are linked by lasers in a mesh configuration. As a simplifying assumption, satellites are going to be considered static. And over this network, an hypothetical warranty service is going to be deployed. 
in order to simplify its study, uh, connections of the service are going to cons be considered homogeneous. Uh, we are going to consider that each uh, link uh, can serve uh, 40 of these connections at most, and all of the connections uh, requested uh, are from uh, users served by the periphery satellites and every one of them is towards the central satellite. Students have to uh, study several routing approaches and they are going to use the circuit switching network uh, simulation tool enhance uh, so uh, different traffics with the same blocking probability may share the same mean value estimator and so uh, the simulations are going to be uh, more efficient first the more classical routing algorithm in the sense that there are not uh, feedback loops in this case uh, if a node has uh, two shortest paths toward the central node it uh, prefers using the one arriving uh, at the central node from the north or from the south direction of course if this uh, first route has not enough resources uh, to carry the request, then the second shortest route is used to. With this uh, configuration, we how the carry traffic changes as we increase the offer traffic. For sources uh, served by satellites B and D, they get the worst uh, service of all of them uh, because uh, they have three first routes uh, offered to them. This result uh, can be also computed uh, sadly uh, using the Erlang formula. And those with uh, the more flexible routing, that is um, satellites at the corners, uh, get the best uh, service of all of them. In this case, what is interesting is uh, the behavior uh, from sources served by satellites C and E. We observe how after a certain point the higher the offer traffic the lower the carry traffic is. This behavior is obviously undesirable and we are going to see the solution with the following uh, routing algorithm. With a more symmetrical routing, first uh, the clockwise route is uh, tried and if this doesn't have enough resources, the anticlockwise route is uh, tried. With this configuration, there are only uh, two blocking probabilities one for those uh, satellites at the cross, B, C, D and E, and another one for those satellites at the corners, F, G, H and I. The satellites at the cross receive the worst service, they are trying only one route, and those at the corners the best service because they are trying two routes. What is interesting is that we see in the cross-satellite case uh, the misbehavior 
the uh, congestion situation where the higher the mean offer traffic is, the lower the mean carry traffic is. This uh, misbehavior uh, can be resolved with the uh, classical approach of reserving the last resources in one link for only uh, first routes. In this way, if we reserve 10% uh, of the resources of a link for first routes, we uh, get this behavior. On one hand, we have eliminated the congestion behavior and on the other hand the service received by each one of the satellites is uh, equalized. This educational case study has taken place in a subject of the third year of the Bachelor degree in Telecommunications Technologies Engineering in the University of Vigo. The students have studied this classic traffic engineering problem where too much flexibility in the selection of routes uh, can have undesirable consequences. In an overload scenario, uh, the carry traffic can decrease as the uh, offer traffic increases. The students have also seen the solution, the classical solution uh, of reservation of last free resources for the use of uh, first routes only. And that's all. Okay, uh, thanks uh, also to you for your presentation. And um, uh, any question from the audience? No. Um, uh, really, I am not expert in your field. I am a mechanical engineering, but I am not expert. But uh, as um, engineering and uh, as a lover of the space enterprise space station, I appreciate a lot of your work. It is very nice. It is very interesting, and uh, it is a very hot topic in this period in which uh, uh, humankind are thinking to explore the, the space and to live in other uh, in the universe. But I wonder if uh, in uh, your study. Are you investigating the problem of uh, space waste? Well, actually, uh, is a little force. Uh, we are now starting a, a project uh, at the first of this month, <laughs> investigating some things about the user loop and about the routing within uh, obviously, an academic at, at, at this time of the routing of uh, the connections and of packets. In, in, in this case, we have forced uh, a, a service with connections just in order to uh, students to see a modern scenario with a little more uh, antique uh, technique that is uh, the, the, the circuit switching. Of course, um, the effects that we see with circuit switching, that the carry traffic uh, go down as uh, offer traffic increases, is also uh, possible in packet switching, but it is uh, more difficult to see. Then we, we have, in this academic study, a center on uh, the most easy to see case with circuit switching and of course, the packet switching version uh, is going to be explored also in, in this project. Okay, thank you for this clarification. Uh, we will follow your research and we will keep in touch. <laughs> okay. Um, if uh, there are no questions, um, I thanks again to you. And we can start with the third presentation. Uh, the title of the third presentation is uh, implementing the BBA agent based model of a sports betting in change. I guess that the presenter is uh, Dave, Dave Cliff. Is it right? 
Good morning, Dave. Uh, good morning. Actually, uh, the presenter is going to be James Keen. Sorry, James Hawkins. Okay. Um, uh, so you are both of you are there. So James, pardon me for uh, misunderstanding, and uh, please share your screen. Uh, doesn't look like I have the option to actually share my screen in the. Uh, um, you can Chrome. click on on the top. It is a little row near the red button. Yeah. Otherwise, I ask to Katerina to support us. And okay, I will share the video. Yeah. Okay. If you could share the video, that would be great. Thanks to the super Katerina. <laughs> I'm Dave Cliff and I'm a professor of computer Hello, I'm Dave Cliff and I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Bristol in the UK. This paper is co-authored with three recent graduates from our computer science master of engineering degree. And all the work described here today was done by them, not me. But we listed our names in alphabetic order of family name, which is why I come first. Really, all the work was done by my three co-authors who each wrote their master's thesis on this BBE project, which we're going to explain. So now I will hand over to them for the rest of this presentation. Hi, I'm James Hawkins. Hi, I'm James Keane. Hi, I'm Roberto. In our paper, we described three independent implementations of an agent-based model of a sports betting exchange. The model is called BBE, which stands for the Bristol Betting Exchange. The motivation for constructing this agent-based model is so that it can serve as a synthetic data generator producing large volumes of data that can be used to develop and test new betting strategies via advanced data analytics and machine learning techniques. The particular style of betting that we've concentrated on is called in-play or in-race or in-game betting, which is where bettors can place bets on the outcome of a track race event, such as a horse race, after the race has started and for as long as the race is underway, with betting only ceasing when the race ends. By the way, we do recognise that in some countries, betting is seen as of questionable morality and may even be illegal. But the four of us are all based in the UK, where betting, as described here, is entirely legal and where betting companies pay corporate taxes that help fund public research. First, we should explain about sports betting exchanges. So, the first commercially successful Excuse betting exchange... Excuse me, Katerina. Major innovator in this space the, the, was the, the audio is the going, major. but not the slide. The key innovation was the recognition that the technologies used by financial exchanges, which acts as a platform where buyers and sellers can find to be matched with counterparties to a trade, can be adapted to act as a platform where bettors can find to be matched with people to bet against. That's why they're called betting exchanges. Betface saw away success was echoed by other participants in this space, notably BetDAC and Smarket. All three of these are web-based platforms and the use of web technologies enabled another innovation, the introduction of in-play betting. Because the situation in the sports event can change second by second, in-play betting is an area that is ripe for automated betting systems to outperform human bettors. In the same way that high-speed automated trading in financial markets has now made many human traders redundant. But to do this using machine learning, we need lots of high temporal resolution data from the betting exchange. This is available from, for example, Betfair, but it's very expensive and also finite. So we created BBE as a synthetic data generator to create arbitrarily large amounts of high resolution sports exchange data for training in-play automated betting systems. All of this background is explained in our EMSS paper and in this bigger paper by Dave Cliff from early 2021, which is available as a free download from SSRM. In this 10 minute video presentation, we want to concentrate on showing you illustrative results and explain the differences between the three implementations. So we'll skip over the background and refer you to our papers to find out more. The three implementations of BBE were created independently from one another. Two main motivations were the trade off between accessibility and specialization and the desire to independently replicate results. The single threaded Python implementation was created by me, Roberto, the multi threaded Python by James Keane, and the multi core multi-language implementation by James Hawkins. For the STP implementation, before the beginning of the actual race, each better can be allocated the number of prior simulations to create their own beliefs of how the real race will finish. Each better then runs their own versions of the race using the same race conditions and then ranks the horses into their predicted final standings. Currently, the win probabilities for each horse that determine these predicted standings are calculated using the number of predicted victories, as well as the overall average final position given the number of simulations the better makes. The betters then refer to these predicted standings when the real race begins. So update their opinions given the events that occur during the race. 
Here we can see two graphs from an example race that were produced by the STP implementation. The graph on the left shows a distance time graph for a simulated two kilometer race with five horses participating, and each time step is measured in seconds. The graph on the right shows the second by second updates to each horse's odds of victory that a better made while observing the race. The lower the odds that a better believes the horse has, the more likely it is that it believes the horse will win, and vice versa. For example, for this better, notice how horse five, the green line, was the least favorite given the better's prior simulations of the, of the race, but eventually won the race itself. Conversely, horse one was a favorite and eventually finished last. During the real race, the better gradually updated their beliefs to reflect the real events that occurred, eventually determining correctly that horse five is the winner and horse one was going to be the last place finisher. As the process by which each better runs their prior simulations is single threaded, this makes it slower to run than the other two implementations. However, I made two additions to my implementation that should make it accessible for others. Firstly, I made a simple command line interface that can be run as a Python file, and the user can simply input the number of horses, the number of betters, and the number of BBE instances they would like to run. Following on from that, I also began work on an option to use Amazon Web Services to provide a faster method to simulate multiple BBE instances concurrently. Further work is needed, however, to make this cloud-based version publicly viable. The second implementation was a multi-threaded implementation, and it's important to implement this alongside a single-threaded implementation because it's been shown uh, in Cliff and Rollins 2020 that single-threaded implementations of synthetic data generators that have been used in the financial markets are limited in the extent to which they can accurately assess the profitability of an automated agent. And that's because they can't meld all the latency that operates in real markets. So in a synchronous implementation, a better may look at the exchange's market data and use this to calculate the best order to send to the exchange. However, if better uses a complex time-consuming algorithm, then by the time a decision is reached, a quicker algorithm may have already succeeded in executing a bet. As a result of this, the market, which receives a slower trader's order, may look vastly different than the one on which its calculations are based. And this renders it far less profitable than initially expected. So a multi-threaded implementation that's able to accurately model latency uh, can take this limitation into account. Furthermore, a multi-threaded implementation also allows the development of arbitrage betters. An arbitrage better basically looks at two separate exchanges, backs a competitor on one exchange, and then lays the same competitor on the other. And that allows them to make profit regardless of the outcome if the opportunity is there. To showcase the real-world impact and the accurate modeling of latency within a multi-threaded BBE, an experiment was set up. So there are two arbitrage betters, A1, A2, each with access to two different exchanges, E1 and E2. To simulate the impact of latency, better two, that's A2 here, has a time delay of two seconds applied to it when it comes to constructing their orders. Apart from that, everything else, the logic, everything else is identical. The end result was a profit of £127 for A1 and a large profit of £142 for A2. At first glance, it may seem like the slower agent was actually able to perform better than the quicker agent. However, these profit figures only tell half the story. The reason for the lower profit was that A2 was only actually able to find a counterparty for its layback. The time delay, meaning that the opportunity to back, was missed because the odds on the market had moved. As a result, if competitor 10 had won instead of lost, A2 would have actually lost a significant amount of money, as it would have been unable to fulfill its purpose as an arbitrage better and make both back and lay bets in time. This is parallel to what happens in real betting markets, where a slow arbitrage better can not just lose out on profitable bets, but can also open himself up to a significant amount of risk by not being able to hedge his bets. This showcases the advantage of an asynchronous multi-thread implementation over a synchronous one and in evaluating the profitability of automated basic agents in the real world. So briefly, some background on my implementation. One of the ways in which diversity of opinion amongst bettors can be implemented is to give them access to the results of a number of trial runs of the race. They can then use the results of these trial runs to estimate the odds of the horse winning. Now, in these graphs, we can see how bettors view on each horse's chance of winning may vary depending on the number of races they're able to simulate. So we can see the frequency of wins on the y-axis and the, the horse's ID is on the x-axis. The key area is a better with a higher number of simulations is meant to model someone who is better at judging how a race may play out given its current state. This means the odds they end up with for each horse are closest to the horse's true odds of winning. To model in-play betting, bettors need to continually revise their opinions as a race plays out. Here we can see how a betting agent's opinion on the odds may change over time by running their allocated number of trials at regular intervals. For each trial, the horses start at current positions of the horses in the race simulation that's being bet on. Now, an exchange with around 100 betters with an average of 100 simulations each would require a total of 10,000 simulations to be ran each time the betters' opinions are updated. Now, this would mean it would take ages just to run a single bet betting session, let alone the thousands required to train a machine learning algorithm. So my solution to this problem was to program the races to run in parallel on a GPU. 
Now, this was achieved using a framework called OpenCL that allowed me to submit tasks to the GPU from a Python host and allowed for thousands of races to be ran concurrently. Here we can see a comparison of how runtime scales the number of competitors for a single race. The data points for STP and NTP exchanges, which simulates the races serially at the top here, uh, were generated by measuring the total lapse time of running a thousand race simulations and calculating the mean. The MTM points at the bottom are the mean values for runs of 100,000 simulated races on a 640-core NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 GPU. Now, what we can see from this graph is that the GPU is able to accelerate runtime by up to a thousand times simply by running these races in parallel. While much quicker than a single-threaded Python implementation, the usage of OpenCL significantly increases the technical barrier of entry to those who'd like to make modifications to the race implementation. So there is a payoff between speed and accessibility. We have to wrap up now. We're almost out of time. There are lots of opportunities for further work, extending what we've done here. There isn't enough time to read through all the things on this slide, but they're each discussed further in our papers and our three master's dissertations, each of which is available on ssrn.com. And so that's our paper summarised in 10 minutes. Here's the summary slide, which we're not going to read out. But thank you very much for listening to our presentation, and we'd now be very happy to take any questions. OK, well, uh, excuse me for some technical problem. Um, I tried to follow, in any case, the presentation. Now you understand it, then I must contact you for belt sport. So if I would like to win my games, I am joking. Um, just a, a, a clarification. If I well understand, is it a real application with uh, real partners? Is it right? Uh, no, at this stage, it's, it's just a proof of concept. But we are ah, very, okay, a pilot study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we would, uh, if anyone who runs a betting exchange wants to get in touch, we would be very happy to talk to them. Okay. Uh, in betting strategies, um, it is clear that uh, uh, there are several factors to take in consideration. So it is um, more or less a decision problem. I am wondering in in, if uh, in uh, your study, are you thinking about uh, to integrate your approach with a multi-criteria decision-making approach, like with specific uh, methodology? I don't know, maybe Prometi, Electri, analytic hierarchy process, or in uh, your opinion, it's not, uh, uh, it is enough uh, to apply your metho method. James, do you want to do that or shall I? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I got the question. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I think the question was just. So, so the, once once you have, once you once you have. Are you investigating uh, to integrate uh, your approach with uh, some other methodologies? Yeah, yeah, we are. I mean, we 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 we've created the simulation as a platform to allow okay. for the study of automating betting and betting is essentially a decision making process you know you have some amount of money there is risk associated with the various options that you could take and then there's a kind of risk reward trade-off that you need to take into account now for sure there's lots of literature out there on decision making under uncertainty uh, and right now we've only taken baby steps because you can only really evaluate those different decision making approaches once you've got a solid platform which is a sufficiently realistic simulation of a sports betting exchange. And for that, you need a sufficiently realistic, sufficiently realistic simulation of actual track racing events that the, the participants can bet on. So we are hopeful that this EMSS paper will be cited for years to come uh, <laughs> as our platform because we've open sourced all the code. So the code is out there for each of the three implementations. And we did that really as a service to the research community, because now if you want to do research in decision making under uncertainty on sports betting exchanges, you can use one or more of the simulations that James and James and Roberta have created as the test bed and take it from there. OK, very, very nice and very interesting. Uh, um, thanks again for your uh, points, for your point of view and for your presentation. Um, so if uh, there are not any questions, um, we can start with um, 
the first presentation. Uh, the first presentation, uh, the title of uh, the last presentation is Dynamic Problem Solving for Assessment of Strategic Engineering Capabilities. I don't know if uh, there are some presenters. Katerina, have uh, you any news about the presenter? It seems uh, it's missing. Oh. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, Professor Bruzzone, uh, it's in another session, but I have his video, so if you want, uh, if you agree, I can share the video for you. Yes, we agree. So you can share the video of the presentation. Please go ahead. Okay, one moment, please. Um, Agostino Brezzone, simulation team yeah, with the Abelet, University of the Future, University of Genoa, in cooperation with several authors, Professor Sasha Macken, Dr. Marina Massey, as well as Paolo Di Bella, Ian Mazzal. I'm going to present you something that uh, is about the strategic engineering. So let me share the screen one moment very quickly, and I will start immediately. Okay, so I think you see now my screen. So the idea is about dynamic problem sourcing assessment of strategic engineering capability. This is a project that is an example of how we can do issue in order to reduce, uh, make an assessment of the skill in strategic engineering. And this is applied to a case study we developed. It's a fictional case study, but pretty realistic. Let me say that illegal weapon traffic at sea is a major issue. It's uh, quite complicated. It requires to coordinate the activity, to fuse data, even to fuse information by different sources to identify where to go, where to act. And normally you have limited resources to carry out this activity. So it's very important to identify how to do. With strategic engineering, obviously we can have an advantage. We can collect information about the flows of goods, from where they come, with insurance, port of start, port of destination. I talk illegal armed traffic on the sea and some kind of blockage, some kind of maritime interdiction to protect the areas from traffic of weapons that are illegal. Um, how it works in strategic engineering? Strategos is an initiative started in Genoa and is very consolidated uh, about developing strategic engineering as a master of science PhD, but even as a concept. You start to get the data, you analyze, filter the data, use this data for model to look forward what will happen in the future, and then based on what will happen in the field collecting data, you identify how to correct the models. In naval framework, I mean, this is very interesting, but in traditional, let me say, joint naval operation, but even on asymmetric warfare, in terms of logistics, port activity, and maritime, as well as in the case that I just mentioned that is dealing with weapon uh, traffic. Um, Strategos, I was saying, is just dealing with that. Uh, is an implementation of strategic engineering that combines modern simulation, data analytics, activity challenge, and closed loop with the big data arriving from the field that require a lot of effort in order to be uh, filtered and can be in some way created people that create solutions to address this aspect, but we need to prepare people to master this technology. So this is the reason why we like to have some assessment of the open of mind of the potential of people in music strategic engineering. There's a huge interest from industry, as you can see, big industry as Leonardo, as Thales, as MBDA, etc., consulting firm as a center, and even NATO centers and uh, the case I propose you is this one where you have um, weapon traffic on an area. It's functional applied to the area of uh, grenadines, but it can be anywhere. And uh, you have to investigate how to deal with this problem that required to combine different aspects. First of all, what data do you process? You process very different data. So you have uh, ships uh, that could be a yacht, a boat, um, a rigid hull, inflatable boat, you have uh, agents on the ground, you collect information by AIS, so by satellite, the position, ESM, image, you have a patrolling corvette on the area that uses its own sensor, you have uh, agents on the field, you have infiltrated people, you have some kind of ESM and decking system and uh, um, let me say web uh, watching, and you have even information from the field about what it happened. 
around one eighth of a million reports per day. If you sample just by 10 milli ads, so a very long rate, you have huge quantity of data. This data is something like that. This is an example. This report is uh, full of information. For instance, say yes, that at this time, uh, NAIS, uh, that means uh, the satellite of a ship, uh, transmits the disposition to avoid collision. We know its coordinate, we know its speed and direction, the flag, and some other one. This information are not always complete and homogeneous, and you need it to, to fuse in order to identify a track because these are plots on the map. But along the time, you can find this information. And you can combine with the GINT and the LINT information to cross communication to identify what is the subject. Because if you want to inspect, if you want to block some suspect, you need to identify where it is. Even decimating, and we are decided to decimate for using for an assessment made by a young engineer. So we provide this as a case with a framework where it can play. It's a lot of data. We talk about 1 million data generated in four days at just this low level of uh, frequency, while in the reality frequency is by seconds. There are not just position and radar tracking, but there are SIGINT and UMINT. UMINT is a report from somebody in the field. The say yes, for instance, in this case, suspect carrier at this position is a, this a small uh, Ship with the flag from UK that is a cargo, sorry, that is a cargo that move over there. And I have reported that it's not synchronous. It means something that happened in the past or something that we expect they, they, they expect to happen in the future. Uh, this is the synchronous uh, characteristics uh, uh, make it even harder to fuse the data together because they're related to different source, different platform, different sensor, different times. And uh, even different relevant or reliability because local cost guard is different what you see by yourself and so on. OSINT is very important because a lot of information came from open source intelligence that could provide you information that is not just satellite but even web communication. Often over there there is hidden some material or you can identify something happened even indirectly, you know, because some smuggler is going there and other people don't go there. Mm, this is an uh, evidence of how do you fuse data you mean Cybint, SIGINT, and uh, even the sensor of the vessel are part of the game. This game is supposed, what, what is your goal? Your goal is to demonstrate you have a capability to define models, to define data fusion algorithm, to define uh, artificial intelligence criteria or solution to filter data and to support the planning for inspection by the corvette that you have. You have many symptoms and suspects around that could be very different kind of traffic, uh, very different alerts, uh, very different source that can inform you about risk. And you have to define an architecture that identifies this risk. But even if you go at the level, so you want to fuse just patient asynchronous data, this is interesting. For instance, to identify if there is suspect matching, if there is some combi combination of satellite image with AIS, with uh, radar tracking, and this one is a basic data, it's not basic data fusion, but sophisticated data fusion, but it's a way to. We create a simulator, or not just a simulator, but a real strategic engineer approach to combine simulation data analytics. Sector is called C3 years, machine smuggling by strategic engineer approach. This is the general architecture, as you can see. It's three main modules simulation analyzer, simulation models, map line. The user can play with the key parameter and can show if understood the concept. The situation analyzer take the data based on the criteria that you that they fuse together. Simulation, so you say you what happened in the past, so a posteriori. A priori analysis made by simulation model. And smart planner try to identify the best strategy to mix together and to identify, for instance, the patrolling of the covet, just patrol or just go to inspect some boat or to stay in an area to prevent something happen over there. This is the graphic interface of C3E where you have all the track. As I told you, we talk about hundreds and hundreds of both yachts, uh, communication, and a million of data, literally, that are collected. Um, the scenario I mentioned is happening in this area near between Grenada and St. Vincent. It's obviously fictional. You have traffic of ship even out of your interdiction area. And your Corvette could be assigned just to the, some kind of order, and the smart planner should provide this order. And you have to define the principle to feed the, the smart planner, as well as the principle to fuse the data, as well as the 
This scenario, we had a regular cargo ship have different speed, but around 15 knots. The inspection time take one hour. What is the weather in the area? Normally, but even bad, a good condition that affect the, all the operations. If there is the moon or if it's not the moon, based on the night operation. And uh, you have different kind of aspects. The, the area that we inspect is around 100 nautical mile by 100 nautical mile with a single Corvette because the event should be sustainable. Probably the same approach could be designed to be used to define what is the fleet, what kind of sensor you want to use, if you want to use a Corvette, if you want to use a UAV, if you want to use just agents on the field, etc. There are many stochastic factors that influence weather, etc. And there is even limited number of degree of freedom for decision making. In this way, in this case, the degree of freedom are just about the planning of operation from the convert. So who expect where to go, where to patrol, how to patrol is a spira, is a segment, is um, addressing uh, some uh, boarding, etc. So this provides a quick overview, but the concept is interesting and it could be a very good way in order to identify the capability because by playing this game, we have the possibility to identify Uh, Katerina, maybe there was some problem with the audio. Uh, yes, but I don't know. Yeah, yes, for the for the last second of the of the videos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, 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 I think that we can uh, are uh, closing the the the, the video because. Uh, the idea of the research was very clear and uh, I would like to thank, thank Antonio to have a, give the opportunity to uh, to see this nice presentation of our Professor Bruzzone. Th thanks to and you. Um, if you have uh, any further information, if you have question or from further information, uh, you can write to him. Uh, yes, we will contact uh, Professor Bruzzone. And at this point, we we can um, well finish our presentation, and so we can close our session. And I would like to thank you all of you for all uh, for your nice and interesting presentation. Personally, it was a, a great opportunity to to meet you and to share ideas with you. Um, I hope that we will see in person next year in Rome. And uh, I remember that uh, after the virtual coffee break, uh, we will start at 11 o'clock, the second part of uh, the session. And uh, don't forget to attend the ceremony, the closing ceremony at 12.30. So don't miss, miss uh, it. Thank you again for all of you. And uh, thank you to the great support of Katerina, uh, that it was very useful. Um, we will keep in touch on, how, on our social network and uh, I hope in a future collaboration with, uh, with you. Thank you to all of you and see you later. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank thank you. You. Bye, bye. 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 Bye.